Well, good afternoon, and thanks to PLC for everything that you put together here. Um, the title of this session is Whose Money Is It Anyhow? And I thought that title needed a little bit of an explanation. Now, you've just heard from Mark Janis about his case at the United States Supreme Court. I'll let our panelists explain uh, what the Supreme Court's ruling means for Pennsylvania. For the moment, I just want to make clear that the fundamental constitutional question underlying Janus had to do with the power of the government to tell people how to spend their own money. Justice Alito, writing for the majority in Janus, gave this hypothetical. He said, suppose that a particular group lobbies or speaks out on behalf of what it thinks are the needs of senior citizens or veterans or physicians, to take just a few examples. Could the government require that all seniors, veterans, or doctors pay for that service even if they object? It has never been thought that this is permissible. Skipping ahead just a bit, he says, in simple terms, the First Amendment does not permit the government to compel a person to pay for another party's speech just because the government thinks that the speech furthers the interest of the person who does not want to pay. Now that the Janus case has been decided, will our policymakers respect these principles? And in what new contexts will this country battle over the meaning of the First Amendment? We've got a diverse panel here, but what may unite them best is their answer to the question, whose money is it anyhow? My name is David Osborne. I'm president and general counsel of the Fairness Center, a nonprofit public interest law firm. We offer free legal services to those who are hurt by public sector union officials. At the time Janus was decided, we represented seven Pennsylvania teachers in four different cases, raising the same constitutional claims at issue in Janus. And interestingly, those cases are actually still pending a decision. I'm happy to talk further about that case in Q&A if you're interested. And before I introduce our panelists, let me sketch out our agenda for this afternoon. Um, I've asked each one of our panelists to give a brief opening statement. We'll have a discussion here on the stage, and then I'd like to ask for questions from attendees. As I understand it, PLC has index cards on which you should write any questions. If you don't have any on your table, you can certainly raise your hand. Volunteers will make rounds to collect those cards and then uh, get them up here to the stage. You're welcome to fill those out at any time, and volunteers, you can go ahead and deliver them up here at any point. Um, State Representative Kate Klunk is a ninth generation Hanover area resident, and since 2014 has served the 169th uh, legislative district in the Pennsylvania General Assembly. She's also a deputy whip and serves on four House committees, including the Labor and Industry Committee. Prior to her election, she worked in the George W. Bush White House. She earned her bachelor's from Dickinson College and her law degree from Dickinson Law. Um, Keith Williams, down on the far end of the stage, is a Lancaster County native and worked for 21 years as a Pennsylvania public school teacher before joining Americans for Fair Treatment as the Pennsylvania Director of Outreach last year. Keith became active in uh, public sector union issues when the teachers union for his school in Conewago Valley negotiated to make 45 teachers, including him, contribute annual fees to the union even though they were not union members. Within two years, Keith and his co-workers had pushed the teachers union to drop their requirement. Francisco Molina, just to his left, uh, formerly worked for Lehigh County's Department of Children and Youth Services as a social services aide. During much of his time at the county, he was an active union member and even served as a shop steward for a time. Shortly after Janus was decided, uh, Mr. Molina told the county to stop dues deductions because he was resigning from the union. But the county told him to ask his union officials instead. He sent a union resignation letter to his union, but union officials ignored it and continued to take dues from him. With the help from the Fairness Center, full disclosure, Mr. Molina is one of my clients. He sued his union to establish his First Amendment right to resign from the union at any time. And finally, Coral Morera, um, just to uh, Representative Clunk's right, is the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association, a statewide business organization representing the interests of manufacturers in Pennsylvania's public policy process since 1909. Carl oversees the strategic external communications of the association. He also acts as a writer, producer, and reporter for PMA Perspective, a weekly half-hour news program on Pennsylvania business, government, and politics. He also acts as the editor of the PMA Bulletin, a premier in-depth analysis of current issues facing Pennsylvania businesses. Um, so we'll start again with, uh, with opening statements here. Kate? 
Sure, thank you so much for having me today so I can take a, a couple minutes to talk about my House Bill 785. So 785 is in response to the Janus decision. You heard a little bit about that um, from Mark himself, uh, which is actually really great, and uh, David gave you a little bit of background on it. So here in Pennsylvania, we have had a fair share law. And because our law is the same as uh, the law in Illinois, we need to move to repeal it because it's unconstitutional. So my bill does a couple things, it does that, and it also provides notice to those employees that might fall under or have fallen under a fair share fee scenario. Now you would think that it would be easy to get something very simple uh, through the legislature, but we have had some pushback. Um, but again, my mantra has been, no one was ever worse off for knowing their rights, right? 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 No one was ever worse off for knowing their rights. And, and getting back to the theme, you know, whose money is this anyhow? Well, it's the employee's money. And in the Janus decision, the Janus decision talks about that, not the big P political money, but the little P political money that comes into this fair share fee that these non-union members have to pay. And that money that they've had to pay over the years goes to you know, cover the contract negotiation. And you would think, oh, well, it covers the contract negotiation, but that little P politics comes into every single contract that is negotiated at your local municipal level, at your borough, at your township, or your local school district, because there are, are political, small p, political consequences associated with those negotiations. Maybe uh, you know, an, an increase in salary might result in an increase in your local property taxes, for example. So there are those small p political influences um, that come into play with those fair share fees. So when the Janus decision came down, uh, I'm an attorney and I sat down and said, well, you know, we need to make sure that workers here in Pennsylvania know their rights. Again, no one is ever worse off for knowing their rights. Uh, we drafted a bill uh, that would have been uh, in response to the Janus decision. We had a hearing on the bill. And we actually sat down and talked with uh, those employers, those the local school board um, uh, members, um, superintendents, union members. You name it, the stakeholder, we included them at the hearing. And out of that hearing, we boiled down the bill this year to some very, very simple things. The bill does literally a handful of things. You can read it in three minutes. It's pretty simple. Um, you can probably read it in the time that I've been talking here. Again, it repeals the unconstitutional provision. It provides notice, which is really the crux of what we need to do. Uh, notice is required in so many other areas. You, you've got notice for, um, you, you, you see the postings, you get the notices when you're a new hire, um, prov uh, minimum wage. EEOC, uh, discrimination, all OSHA, all of those things that are noticed um, to employees. So there's really nothing different to this. So the bill for those fair share payers, those non-union members, they would receive a notice from the employer, not the union, from the employer. The employer is the one that really should be letting folks know what their rights are. That's the right entity to express those rights. And those rights would be expressed to those fair share non-union members, but then also those members um, who are the new members, um, you know, coming in, those new employees. These employees need to know that they should not be compelled to hand over this money to the union without their affirmative consent. If they believe that they are, in fact, you know, getting a good deal in handing over their money for contract negotiations or whatever it is that the union does, they should you know, make that decision for themselves. Um, and they should know that their employment is not, uh, it's not required for them to hand over that money as a condition of employment. So that's really what the bill does. <laughs> it's, it's very, very simple. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I wish all of you guys would take a minute, read the bill. Again, it's pretty quick. Um, and 
after today, after our discussion today, if you really are truly uh, passionate about this issue, which I think you should be, um, you know, there's an opportunity for you to get involved. Um, one way, if you want to let your legislator know um, that you are supportive of House Bill 785, there are some pamphlets on each of the tables, and you can text workers to 52886. And you can send that message right to your state representative, your senator, and let them know that you're supportive of letting workers know their rights. So, thank you. Thank you, Kate. Keith? Sure, thank you, David. Um, so, I was an English teacher, as David said. I was an English teacher for a grand total of 21 years. 18 of those were at the Conewago Valley School District. Um, so what I really want to zero in on is, um, you know, as Representative Klunk said, uh, this bill is really not, um, not rocket science. It's a very straightforward thing, um, notification to employees of their rights. Um, and as I've been explaining to a lot of people, it's almost like Mirandizing someone. Like if you can imagine an, a, an outcry by a political lobbying group over the idea of reading someone their Miranda rights. Um, this is, it's, it's really a, um, a consumer protection bill, um, you know, and the consumer in this case being the, uh, the public sector employee who was presented with the idea of union membership. Um, there's really two quotes, and again, I was an English teacher, so, so humor me for a second. I'm a, I'm a quote guy. Um, there's two quotes that really stick with me um, as I've transitioned into this new role with Americans for Fair Treatment. Um, and that first one is, um, over 100 years ago, Mark Twain said, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. Um, and I think that's very true when we talk about uh, the messaging that's out there right now regarding um, both Mark's case, um, as he told you, and then also as, um, as Representative Klunk was talking about her bill. Um, you'll hear a lot about this being an attack on workers and an attack on worker rights. It's, it's actually further from the truth. Uh, it's, it's quite opposite. Um, really, this is about telling people what their rights are. And I don't think a lot of people who, uh, who haven't been in, in education or in the public sector truly understand the need. Um, and I can tell you what's going to happen in August when, you know, 180,000 teachers, public school teachers, go back to school on that first day. They're going to hear um, from their superintendent. They'll get the state of the, state of the district address. Um, and then at some point in that first in-service day with all of the, the school district employees in the auditorium, um, that superintendent will hand over the podium to the local union president. And at that point, everybody in that auditorium will hear the message about, from, from the local union president, about how great union membership is. Um, unfortunately, they don't get to hear the other side. They don't really get to hear that you know, this isn't a condition of employment. So it's a very, um, I use the analogy, it's kind of like a, uh, a um, timeshare pitch, except you don't get any free towels, you don't get any free be beach towels at the end of it. Um, so that's really, I guess, the context of, of the need. Um, and uh, I think it's important to note too, um, as we're talking to teachers and doing a lot of outreach, that um, it's very easy to fall into the trap, and I think this is something that uh, the teachers unions have done very well with, um, to equate teachers with the union. And I think, you know, for all of us, um, when we're talking about public schools and public school teachers, it's very easy to slide into the, um, the frustrations with the union becoming a frustration with public school teachers. Not all public school teachers are socialists. Um, not all public school teachers are, you know, opposed to uh, what we all believe here sitting in this room. Um, in fact, you know, as you may have, have heard, um, there were over 40 teachers, um, over a quarter, almost a third of our school district's teachers who were not even in the union. Um, so, you know, that, again, the idea that that message of uh, all teachers being, you know, card-carrying liberals, uh, that's not necessarily true, but regardless, um, this bill really isn't even a question of political ideology. It's really just simply about worker freedom. And uh, we even have uh, people who have aligned themselves with us who are, um, I would say, politically very opposite on a lot of things. But at the end of the day, no one believes that uh, anyone should be compelled to support a political ideology that 
they don't agree with. And um, to that end, I'll leave you with uh, one last quote. And uh, this quote is a, a Thomas Jefferson quote. Um, and I believe it, it really applies in this context. And he said, to compel a man to furnish funds for the propagation of ideas which he disbelieves and abhors is sinful and tyrannical. And those are, those are powerful words, to say sinful and tyrannical. Um, thank you. And I should note that um, the year that our district, our local union, voted to go fair share, I actually printed that quote out about half a dozen times, and I, along with several other teachers, put that on the outside of my classroom door as a statement to the local union that uh, we were in slight disagreement. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, there are teachers out there who are aligned. We do understand the issue and we're willing to speak out. And I think that is my challenge to you is to, uh, to come alongside teachers, um, you know, rather than come down on them. Um, we all know teachers. We all know teachers who, um, you know, are in public schools. Um, and I would say talk to them, find out what their fears are, find out what their concerns are, come alongside them and help them to see that, you know what, um, your local union may have a practical purpose, but the state and national are just taking your money. Um, and I'll leave you with one last statistic here, and then I'll, I'll pass it on. Um, when it comes to dues, one of the things most people don't understand is that most of that money, and we're talking about whose money is it anyway, um, we generally have an issue with how the state and national unions spend their money. NEA is a $1.62 billion corporation. Um, who will tell you that your dues don't fund politics, right? Um, of the $754 that our uh, union at New Oxford, at Conewago Valley, uh, collects this school year, $754 per teacher, only $30 stays with the local union. Now, they're in contract negotiations this year. Um, the local is the one that's doing all of the negotiations work. The PSEA, the NEA, they're not involved. So the local union's doing all the work, and they're collecting about 4% of what uh, a teacher is paying in dues dollars. The other 96% goes to the state and the national unions. Um, so when you, when you can illustrate those types of um, abuses to a public sector worker, um, you know, a lot of people are already feeling like they don't have a voice in all of this. Um, so it's, it's really, it's an education effort, um, and at the end of the day, um, it's important, I think, for all of us to recognize that, you know, this is just simply, um, in, in regard to Representative Klunk's bill, just letting people know what their options are. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to you, uh, Mr. Osborne. And Thank you. you can... Francisco? All right, active follow there. Hi, this, um, I'm the, from the public sector, and so this, uh, this issue is very personal to me. So I prepare something that I felt I need to share with you, but I have it in writing, so bear with me for a minute, please. In January of 2018, I was working as a case A3 for Lehigh County Children and Youth. This whole thing in my representing union was local, um, SAIU local 668. It came full circle for me, Entire situation came full circle for me when I thought I would be attending a simple union meeting at the Lehigh County Government Center. A local union business agent had called for a mandatory meeting with all its members. During this meeting, she and other officials handed out new membership cards for us to sign, which I thought was odd and unusual. Why would we need to sign new membership cards? So I asked my the business agent who was leading the meeting, and she told us, that, they, that the old ones were invalid, and the new ones would be litigation proof post a possible unfavorable Janus ruling. I had no idea what that meant. So while other people were just signing the cards and handing them in, I sat and read the fine print. I found some really unquestionable language. By signing that card, I would be signing I would be waiving my rights and I would be allowing the union to take money from directly from my paycheck on my right direct checking account. Even if I was a non-member, if I resigned, if I got fired, or I got, fire, I got resigned or fired from my job. And that didn't sit well with me. 
so I flat out refused to sign. I thought, I thought what they were doing was wrong and dishonest, so I began to personally and via group me, email to alert everyone about our union deceptive request and encourage them to read the fine print for themselves and to make an informed decision that would personally be in their best interest. Then the union started treating me really hostile, calling for my termination. They even accused me of directly working with anti-union groups during a time that I was alone and just trying to help and educate my coworkers about their personal rights and our union deceptive practices. But they just continued collecting signatures by telling people that I was lying to them. The union was really upset with me and I, felt, I felt personally threatened when they made it known that they could reach out to any of my loved ones at any time or any place when they decided to reach out to my daughter who they never met at a local dog park. I reported this I reported this and other incidents to my office director and to the director of human resources as they happened. And I received no assistance from them or anyone else. In fact, my human resources director informed me to contact my union office because there was absolutely nothing she could do for me, nor would she be able to stop any fees deduction from being taken from my payroll check or anyone else that was requesting it at the time. In June 2018, I spoke in a, at a county commissioner's meeting for the first time and told them that I was being harassed by union officials while on county time and while on county property and explained to them exactly what was happening to me and to my other county workers. But no resolution or assistance was offered. I suddenly realized I was up, up against a corporation or an agency that was well established with endless financial resources, that was not interested in serving its members' well-being as I, and I was all alone. I officially was able to resign from the union in July 2018 following the Janus ruling via a certified letter to the union in the county of Lehigh. In my resignation letter, I cited the Janus ruling and requested at all in any automatic withdrawal of any fees, union fees from my check to stop immediately since I was not given them any consent. But the county and the union just continued to take these dues or these fees. The county and the union still responded when they contracted my job out to an outside vendor and wrongfully dismissed me after 14 years of service with the county. It is my personal belief and conviction that people should have the right to join a union, but they should also have the right to leave a union without being intimidated or harassed by anyone. Especially, <laughs> especially if that union isn't acting in their best interest. The Janus ruling was not intended to end or destroy the public sector unions. It was about having the ability to choose. The Janus ruling should have been a wake-up call for the unions to do a better job and become transparent with its members. And I hope that as a result of members speaking out about concerns that negatively affected them pre and post the Janus ruling, that one day they will be able to reach this goal. Thank you. Okay, as a reminder, if you have questions for uh, the, the panelists here, uh, they have index cards on your table. You can hand those to a, our well-dressed volunteer over here, and uh, he'll run those up to the stage. Um, Carl. You know, I have some prepared remarks, but I have to uh, commend you on your remarks, and, and I want to add a little something. Um, up until about two or three years ago, um, there was a legislative change that was made. Up until two or three years ago, it's illegal to stalk someone in Pennsylvania. It's illegal to harass someone in Pennsylvania. It is illegal to threaten the use of weapons of mass destruction against someone else in Pennsylvania unless you are an active party in a labor dispute. 
That was law up until about two or three years ago in Pennsylvania. That loophole has been closed. But to, to Kate's point, you have no idea how hard legislatively it was to try to close that loophole. And why? Because the public sector unions objected. And do you think that it's the rank and file members of the union that disagree? Do you think that a rank and file member, do you think a, a teacher thinks that it's the right thing to do to be able to stalk someone, to be able to harass someone, to talk to somebody's children at the dog park? No. It's the people at the top who are afraid that their funding is going to get cut. And that's what this is about. So I'm taking a little bit of a different perspective on this from a business competitiveness standpoint, being from the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. So we have to lay a little bit of a foundation here to understand that we have a successful economy only when the private sector economy grows faster than the, the public sector. And that's when an economy can truly begin to flourish. We've seen this in other states. We've seen this in the high-performing states like Utah, North Carolina, and Indiana, sure they have lower tax burdens, but they've also curbed government spending and don't bow to every demand of public sector unions. Sure, these states, again, have more competitive tax rates, but at the same time, why? How can they afford those lower tax rates and what government efficiencies do they have in place that we don't? So according to, I'm, I'm like the, the nerdy guy at the party who has all the stats and data, right? That's why I have to write them down. I'm, I apologize for that. But according to census data, because every cool kid at the party prefers to census data, um, that was normalized by governing.com, Pennsylvania spent close to $2.7 billion on state and local government employees. Um, and given Pennsylvania's population, that averages out to about $205 um, per uh, populace in Pennsylvania. In Utah, that same number is $180. In Indiana, it's $167. In, um, or, I'm sorry, it, it's, it's, it's 180 in Indiana, it's 167 in Arizona, one of the top-ranked states, one of the highest-performing states for attracting new business investment. All of these top-performing states have something in common. First, they're all right-to-work states. Second, they tend to keep the overall cost of public sector services down. But it's not just about price, it's about value, right? So are we getting what we're spending in Pennsylvania? Are we getting businesses the service that they need from regulators, from the different departments that they need answers from in order to conduct their businesses? Anecdotally, any business owner, any manufacturer that I talk to, the answer is a resounding no. In states like Texas, it takes hours or days to turn environmental permits around. In Pennsylvania, you're lucky to get it in the same calendar year. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's proven. Uh, the Cato Institute's Freedom of the 50 States rankings, Pennsylvania ranked 37th. I'm quite honestly surprised we ranked that high. Um, and here's the deal. For decades, Pennsylvania's public sector has been a runaway train. And why? Because of the power that the public sector unions have grown and manifested to the point that they are now... They're, they're, they're stonewalling, they're firewalling meaningful government reforms. It has a trickle-down effect, empowering unions across all sectors of the economy. Pennsylvania is well above the national media when it comes to an overall unionized workforce. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, again, being the cool, cool kid at the party, 13.4% uh, of our workforce is unionized. The national average is 10.7. In South Carolina, the number is 3.6. North Carolina, 4. Arizona, 5.3. Even our mid-Atlantic competitor states like Virginia clock in at 5.5%. When it comes to the number of public sector employees represented by unions, Pennsylvania is at 50.9%, the 11th highest in the nation. Only states like New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut are higher. And quite honestly, they do not have economies that I would like to emulate. Why is this a big deal? Because even the union activists will proudly admit that the presence of unions and unionized workers will artificially raise wages and ultimately the price tag of doing business. And that price tag of doing business is what we focus on from a competitiveness differential. I mean, if we can make it as affordable and as efficient for those jobs and new investment to come to Pennsylvania as possible, that's when our, our um, private sector flourishes. Why does it take so long for issues like liquor reform to pass? Why does it take so long and so much political capital to pass things like meaningful pension reform, where really we only kicked a field goal instead of scoring a touchdown? It's because the public sector unions object. 
We can't even get reforms to get the state from subsidizing the cost of collecting union PAC dollars when it's a common sense, politically popular reform. And why? Because the public sector unions objected. I, you, you quoted some really noble people. I'm about to quote somebody who I think is noble in the late uh, ESPN anchor Stuart Scott, uh, who said, uh, don't hate the player, hate the game. And um, you know, it, this gets to your point where it's not the rank and file members that are the problem here, folks. It's not, don't hate on the teachers, don't hate on the firefighters, the police officers, because they're a part of a system that won't even inform them of their rights and what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. It's not their fault. It really isn't. If anything, what we need to do is embrace them and tell them about their rights. Tell them the different options that they have and bring them to conferences like this so that they can learn about what the free enterprise system is about and what fair representation is. So thank you very much for having me. Thanks, all. Um, Representative Klunk, a uh, question for you about this bill. So you've, you've described it as sort of a common sense reform. Why and, and from where is the opposition coming? So you would think, again, it's, it's a pretty simple, I've heard it um, called vanilla, basic, um, by some other members who are, have been trying to, to talk to other members to get them on board. Really, truly, it's, it's this stronghold of these public sector unions. And interestingly enough, um, I've gone out and I've talked with my friends and family members who are, who are teachers, who might work um, for our local municipalities, who are state employees. And when I explain it to them, they get it because they truly want to know their rights. They don't see anything wrong with the bill. But unions, for whatever reason, they see something wrong with it. And it, it's just baffling to me because these unions are all about protecting worker rights, right? That's essentially why they were all founded. And now we have an opportunity to stand up as, a, as you know, we heard earlier, to stand up. It's a consumer protection issue to stand up for these worker rights, but they're saying no and they're blocking. So it's, it, it, it's incredibly frustrating. Again, I would have each and every one of you, if you are passionate about this issue, pick up the phone, call your local legislator, see where they sit on this bill. Um, there is a companion bill over in the Senate. Um, Senator uh, Martin from Lancaster County has the bill over in the Senate. So pick up the phone, call your House members, call your Senate members, get them on board. Um, explain to them how simple it is and really truly how it's a notification, repeal of, a const of an unconstitutional law, um, and, and making sure that our workers know their rights. It's pretty common sense. Well, I'm trying to be creative here. Could an em employer go so far as to encourage someone uh, to join a union or not to join a union under this notification bill? No. No, there's, there is nothing in this language that really sways either way. And that's, that was actually a byproduct of the negotiations and, and um, discussion that we had with all of the stakeholders was they were really truly looking for a plain, plain, very plain Jane vanilla language in that notice. So the notice really speaks to what the rights are and goes back to that Janus decision, what those rights are of, you know, you, you have a right to for those new employees, join the union or not join the union. And if you choose not to join the union, you're not compelled per the Janus decision to hand over your 100 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever it is, um, in your fair share fee. And it's not a condition of employment. End of story. So Keith, um, what, what's the biggest obstacle to public employees if they decide they, they actually want to leave the union <laughs> and to stop paying uh, using their money to fund the unions. Politically. Yeah, so if you can imagine, um, you know, we all at this point in our lives have cell phones. Um, and if you want to change your cell phone plan, um, you want to switch from Verizon to T-Mobile or to AT&T or whatever, um, your competitor, the, competi the competing uh, cell phone provider will buy out your contract, right? Usually it's a two-year contract. So you could go to any provider at any time and they'll buy out your contract and you can switch providers. If only that were so simple in the public sector. Um, if you want to get out of a union, and, and there are many who do, um, and that's really what my organization does, is we help um, public sector workers 
um, exercise those rights that they are just now learning about. Um, one of the major impediments to that is what they call maintenance of membership. So Mother's Day is coming up. Um, I think my mom is even here. Um, she's over there taking pictures. Um, <laughs> Maintenance of membership um, is one situation where it's okay to not like mom, right? <laughs> Maintenance of membership. It is a 15-day window, usually 15, in some cases as little as 10. At the end, right immediately prior to the end of the contract, when a union member can resign his or her membership. So if I want to get out of my union <clears throat> and say that the, co the contract was recently negotiated, it might be a four-year contract, that means that I have a 15-day window in four years that I have to remember to send a certified letter to the union headquarters requesting that I be let out of the union. If I miss that window on either side, too bad about your luck, you have to wait again until the next window. Um, there are situations in uh, states like Michigan where um, I've heard people say when, when Michigan uh, was dealing with the same situation, the unions would actually change the P.O. box so that you would mail your maintenance of membership, your resignation in that window, and you know, the union would say, oh, sorry, we changed the PO box, we didn't receive that letter in time, um, you're out of luck. Um, there are certain situations we're seeing now with um, unions like SEIU and AFSCME in particular that are um, just flagrantly ignoring uh, people's requests to get out, um, and they're just continuing to take money out of their paychecks, much like Cisco experienced. Yeah, it's, um, I happen to know very well, Cisco, that's part of what his lawsuit is about, is about challenging this maintenance and membership requirement as um, unconstitutional. But Cisco, I've got a, a more personal question for you. Uh, how has um, all of this uh, conflict with the union, how has it affected your family? Oh, wow. That's affected us very deeply. Um, when my dog, I was... We were in conflict with the union, but I thought it was a work-related issue and that it would just stay there. Daughter was a dog park. She was about 20 people there. And she saw this lady come into the park, and she frequented this park quite often. And she just went up to her and started talking to her about me. <coughs> and, and she's like, you're talking about my dad. Oh, you know Cisco. So she let her know all the things that she was talking about, that she was, you know, she confirmed that it was her. And then she went back to work. And um, before my daughter got to tell me, she went back to work in front of my supervisor and she told me, I met your daughter last night, just want you to know that. You're getting how I felt. This is someone who was asking for my termination, someone who made some serious allegations against me. She was not my friend. She was the chapter um, chief shop steward in my office. She's never gone to that park. She figured out how to get to my daughter. And they'd done this before, but they never did, it never happened to me. I never thought it would happen to me. We were driving around and we would look behind the mirror to make sure that no one else was following us. But for me, even emotionally and pressure, I. Look, I came from a very abusive home. Working with kids, I made a real connection with them. I was in a boys' home when I was little. This is my passion. I can relate to these kids. I can help a lot of kids for 14 years. I never got written up. I never got reprimanded. I was a good employee. I didn't believe in the union's philosophy or policies, or, but I had no choice to be a member, okay? The difference between fair share and, and a full member was just that you get to vote on the contract or vote for your local office individuals, leadership. That was it. That's the real big difference, okay? When I asked, when I realized that I couldn't work with them, when I realized that they were hurting more people than they were helping, in the Janus case, and I started reading up on the Janus case, I saw hope. I hope for me to not be associated with them, to be a free agent, maybe perhaps be part of a different union. But that's not the case. 
And our contract was if I don't pay my dues, they can ask for my resignation, my termination. It's part of the contract. If I would have signed the membership card, I would have been locked in for God knows how long. Either a five-year contract, two years in, I resigned. I'm still responsible for the three years, and they would automatically take it out of my personal account. If I would have been fired, like I said, if I would have resigned, or just a simple non-member, I'm still responsible for that dues. And if I would have missed the window, like he said, it would have revolt, re, um, rolled over to the next four or five years. And that's not okay. So when I, I alerted the membership to this concern, I suddenly was like someone with leopard or something. Well, that's a good way to uh, transition to the next question. I th Carl, you mentioned to me at one point that you think some of these reforms could actually make unions better. Yeah, absolutely. How's that? I want unions to earn their members the same way that businesses earn their customers, the same way that associations earn get their members. And you, you don't do that by stalking, intimidating, harassing your members or your, your paying customers. That's not how you would, that, those, those are not good business practices, folks. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that, that can actually happen is that all of a sudden the union leadership listens to the needs of the union members uh, that they're associated with. And it allows for those rank and file members to hold their leaders accountable, um, to make sure that they're pressing for things, whether it be advocacy, whether it be legislation, that actually benefits them, not just the folks at the top. Um, so I absolutely think that this is a pro-worker reform, um, and that the, the, um, those folks at the top of, of the union hierarchy are going to be more responsive to the needs of its members. Yeah, um, one of the uh, audience members asked the question, well, do you have to have a law to overturn something that's been ruled unconstitutional mm -hmm. by the United States Supreme Court? Uh, what's your answer to that? So we, we do, because right now, um, all across Pennsylvania, we have um, school districts that still have this fair share fee component in their contract. We actually just heard of some uh, new contracts that have been negotiated post Janus that still have this option in there. Um, if you know the Supreme Court would come back and, and change their position on um, fair share fees, which I just don't see happening because it is truly political small pe speech um, when the money, the money component comes in. Um, but we need this to make sure that our courts aren't clogged up with all of these lawsuits. Um, and we also need to make sure that we are informing our um, our individuals of their rights. It's, there's no difference um, than between this, the Janus rights and Miranda rights. Yeah, and uh, let me also say, because uh, my clients are some of the ones clogging up the court system with these cases, uh, when, a, when the US Supreme Court decides a particular case, um, it's still a case. Okay, it's not a pronouncement of, of federal law um, in the sense that it, it uh, automatically takes over every other state law and overturns it. It's a case about a particular state law, and in this case, it was about Illinois state law. Um, the Pennsylvania law was not in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, so it actually does take either a case or a law um, to make clear that those statutes, just like the one that was addressed by the U.S. Supreme Court, is also unconstitutional. So I... I I think this is our last question, but I have to ask uh, Representative Clunk because it's a really good one. Um, if, if your bill were to pass, will Wolf just veto it? it it's interesting. Um, I, I don't know what he's going to do. I don't, you know, I can't get into his, his brain there to see if he's going to sign it, um, just let it become law or veto it. But I think if he is smart, he'll take a step back and see the bill for really what it is. Um, it, it's, it's a... <laughs> It's a repeal of an unconstitutional law. I don't think he has um, much of an argument to stand on there. And, and two, in noticing workers of their rights, that is you know, paramount of a governor. A governor should be behind letting every single worker in Pennsylvania who's a you know, new employee coming into state government or those longstanding non-union members know their rights. He is the governor, he represents them. These are employees under his jurisdiction and those employees should know their rights. 
All right, lightning round. Whose money is it anyhow? Keith. Ours. Mr. Molina. <laughs> it is ours. Carl? Yours. It's yours, the employees. <laughs> yep. Thanks. Yep.